five, four, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. You're listening to Working Forward. Presented by Symmetra. In partnership with NASA Reimagine. In this limited podcast series, hosted by Harry Monty, Laura Dynan Haber, Paul Tyler, and Todd Zen, we explore the future of work from a variety of viewpoints and discuss the challenges and opportunities ahead. Hello, and welcome to episode three of the Working Forward podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Todd Zen, and we are thrilled you have decided to join us as we continue to explore the future of work and all the various ramifications of the, the changing environment. Hopefully you were able to join us for our first two episodes where we were able to connect with a futurist to talk about big trends, and we had some great employer guests to talk about how the future of work is impacting employers. I'm really thrilled today that we are going to segue the conversation into employees. So what do employees want for the future? What are their wants and needs? We've got a couple great guests here to dig into that conversation, and I'm excited to introduce them in just one moment. But before I do that, I'd like to bring in our co-hosts. So first, let me welcome into the show, Harry Monty, head of the Group Benefits Division here at Symmetra. Hi, Harry. Hey, Todd. Thanks for the intro and uh, very much looking forward to the conversation today. We've had a first, our first couple of episodes were really good. Where, we, As you said, we talked about future trends and to the employers. Uh, now we really get into it. This is where we start talking about the consumer. And no matter what stakeholder you are in thinking about the future of work, it really is all about the workers, right? Whether it be a traditional W-2 employee, whether it be a contractor or temp employee, um, this is where the rubber meets the road. So I think we have a couple of great guests today to talk about what consumers and employees are looking for, and I think it's going to be a great session. Awesome. Well, thanks, Harry. Uh, As somebody who runs a large organization of employees and also in the group benefits division, where all we do is uh, endeavor to support employees, I can't think of a more resonant topic for us both. So thank you and and welcome. Now let me welcome in our friends from NASA Reimagine, Paul Tyler and Laura Dynan-Haber. Hi, Paul. Hi, Laura. How are you today? Great. Looking forward to the uh, conversation. Yeah, excited to be here. It's going to be interesting, that's for sure. Awesome. Well, uh, let's now welcome in our guests. So I am really thrilled to say we've got two guests joining us from Cake and Arrow, and I'll ask them to explain a little bit more about, about Cake and Arrow. But, you know, just uh, at, a, at a high level, Cake and Arrow is an experienced design and innovation company, and they've done some really fascinating research around employees, what they want, what they need. And, you know, I just know they're going to add an absolute ton to our conversation today. So let me first welcome in Emily Cardinal. Emily, hi. Welcome to the show. Hello, Todd. Uh, thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Can you So can you share with us what you do at Cake and Arrow and, and maybe anything else you might share about, about Cake and Arrow and the work you guys do? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I am our director of content marketing and insights, um, and my role is mostly focused around our proprietary research that we publish as an organization. Um, So we do research with people like employees, which we're going to talk about today, um, and publish those uh, insights. Um, A lot of that work is kind of focused around the insurance and financial services industry because that's kind of the primary customer that we work with. Um, And as an experienced design agency, uh, we work with our clients who, like I said, are primarily um, insurance, financial services, uh, carriers um, and companies, and we work with them to do different kinds of work, but um, it all is kind of based around uh, understanding their customer better, bringing them closer to their customer. It all involves uh, customer research, um, and we also do a lot of uh, product and digital design um, as a layer on top of that. Um, So yeah, I'm happy to be here and excited to talk about our research. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, And let me welcome in also your colleague uh, joining us as well, Jennifer LaRue. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm the Director of Program Management at Cake and Arrow. Uh, 
working on product strategy, client services, and project delivery for our clients. And just really quickly, our human-centric iterative approach to strategy, research, design, and execution. Uh, we really try and take that customer journey and put it into products and services that solve real human problems and deliver results for our clients. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's um, that's a great, all right on theme. And actually, to get us going here today, I'm going to do something a, a little bit different. Uh, might not be that compelling uh, because I'm going to be reading here, but I, I do think it's really important um, because, and I think it illustrates some of the great work that Cake and Arrow does and really great right on our theme. So I want to share just a quick little bit from a report that Cake and Arrow had conducted on uh, burnout. So going beyond burnout, this was a 2021 report. And I think this is going to really frame up our conversation today. So um, the excerpt is as follows. We are now entering a new era of work, one in which employees are looking for their jobs to be more than a means of survival, but not their entire identity either. Rather, in this new era, employees want work to be an integrated, enriching part of their lives, balanced and in harmony with the others, their family, their hobbies, their creative impulses, and their sense of self. In other words, employees are looking for a healthier relationship to work, defined by clear boundaries and expectations, mutual trust and respect, and open and transparent dialogue and conversation. Uh, so I wanted to start with that just because I think it, it pulls on some themes that we heard from, from the Futurist conversation, from our conversation with employers. And I think it's just a great launching off point as we talk about what employers are looking for from their jobs today and what they might be looking for in three, five, 10 years. Um, so let me hit you both with just sort of a really general question as we dive in here. Uh, I'm curious for your perspectives based on your research and, and your observations, you know, how do you see employment changing over time? Do you think it is, um, you know, full time, part time? Are we all going to move to more gig consulting type relationships? Um, you know, interested in any perspective you might have on, you know, how, how, how will work be set up in the future? And maybe Emily, you could go first. Sure. Um, so, of course, you know, this is all speculative. Um, but I think like what we have seen in the research, um, as we've actually followed gig workers over the last, I guess, like five or six years, um, is that kind of at the heart of this question, I think, is um, flexibility and autonomy at work. And that's kind of like what we've seen gig work sort of embody. And so when you ask, um, you know, how do we see employment changing? Will it be more full time? Will there be more gig work? Will there be more consultant roles? I think um, Probably yes to all of these, but also um, just more flexible work arrangements that give employees more autonomy. So if that can be accommodated by, you know, like a more traditional employment arrangement, um, amazing, you know, because there's lots of benefits to that. Um, but, you know, I think we've also seen over, especially the course of the pandemic, you know, you've seen a surge in gig work. Uh, more people than ever are uh, actually like seeking out part-time work. Um, and I think that also bespeaks, you know, just this idea of people wanting to have more of that flexibility within, you know, their schedules, um, but also autonomy over like when and how and where they work. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess my, my follow-up to either you or, or Jennifer is, so when I hear that, I, I think nine to five is blown up, right? You know, there's no more kind of set days. And does this mean four-day work week? Does it mean just work when you can? You know, what, what, do, you, what do you guys think? I mean, is, that, is, are, is the nine to five kind of Monday to Friday work day um, obsolete to some degree? You know, I think that I, I guess I have a few thoughts here. I mean, right now we're obviously like still in a tight labor market. So I think, you know, we're in a place where employees and to some degree are kind of calling the shots. And if that's something that continues, I would say yes. Like, I, you know, I don't know if the nine to five will ever completely die, but I think that um, may not be, you know, Maybe or maybe it'll still be the standard, but, you know, there'll be like different sort of work arrangements that are that are also the norm. 
So, and I think, you know, when we talk about the four day work week, you hear about companies, you know, every day, right. That are kind of embracing this and experimenting with it. The one I read about recently that really surprised me was Lowe's. Um, they were having all of these scheduling problems with their full-time employees who basically were like having to work weekends all the time and were really fed up with that. So they like embraced, you know, you guys can work a four day week and this should make sure you have two consecutive days off. Um, all the time, whatever happens with the schedule. So that being said, I think these like kinds of things will like continue to be embraced um, as long as, you know, the employees are sort of in the position of like wielding more power, which is kind of allowed for a lot of this to happen um, in the last couple of years. Um, But it's also a trend, you know, that we've been seeing for the last 10 years. So I don't know. It's hard to say if that will completely go away, but I do definitely think we're going to see um, more companies embrace um, different uh, arra- work, work arrangements. Um, but I don't. I don't really see the nine to five just being coming completely obsolete at the same time. So, I think I'd, I think I'd second that. I think that what I find interesting is this idea of of how can employers start to shift to thinking more about outcomes and outputs versus time spent. Uh, and I think that that's where that, that merge of, of that flexibility and that autonomy and how can the employer really just focus on those outcomes and what their employees, what that, what that relationship looks like there versus a true schedule or time or nine to five. So maybe this is just building on um, some of the comments you've already made, but I was reading your research paper uh, titled Gigged Out and it was it was fascinating, and a couple of things really resonated with me uh, in that particular paper. One is uh, a comment that treating gig like it's a, a, a niche is a mistake, that uh, those workers are really representative of larger trends. And the second was that traditional work is becoming more like gig work. And um, I'd love to hear more about those two concepts from you in regard to uh, how that impacts the way people are going to are going to work in the future, right? Those trends and um, this blurring of the line between a traditional employee and a, and a gig employee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think there's there's a, a lot to unpack there. So, like I had mentioned, you know, we've been looking at gig workers um, uh, over the last like five or six years. We've done multiple research studies. We've done projects with our clients. Um, we revisited them after, like right after the onset of the pandemic. And um, as you just mentioned, I think what one of the things that, uh, you know, I guess a few months, six months into the pandemic that we really started to notice was a lot of the what we were hearing about um, employees felt really familiar to what we had already heard from gig workers. And some of these things have to do with, you know, like, um, just like the basics of uh, having more flexibility at work. So a lot of the people that we had talked to were choosing gig work because it gave them more flexibility. Um, A lot of people were doing gig work because they had other like family obligations and things like that, or they were working in creative fields where there wasn't a lot of full-time work. Um, So you saw a lot of that same uh, stuff start to happen with employees where employees were like, oh, I, you know, I really like remote work because I can actually start picking my kids up from school. So you start to see some overlap in a lot of different areas. And, and some of it, I think, was positive. I think that like the flexibility that people had um, to work remotely, to maybe move hours around to accommodate like other priorities in their life um, was great. And I think that getting a taste of that for regular employees um made it hard for them to come back from that. I know like speaking myself as a parent who had a six month uh, old baby when the pandemic started and is about to have another one, it's hard to imagine like having to be full time in an office with an infant um, after having the experience of being home with my son for, you know, the better part of three years now um, and also working of course too. So um, sorry if that was a bit of a tangent, um, but, uh, I think where I was going with, with with this is that I think there's a lot of uh, positives um, that have come out of this, and those have resembled the positives of doing gig work and some of the incentives for doing gig work um, for full-time employees. But then there's the negative side of gig work. 
which I think has to do with a lack of stability um, and uh, maybe a, a sense of like disconnection from colleagues and community in, in your community and even your employer. And so um, those are things that I think uh, are going to need to be grappled with uh, as uh, um, as we see like as we see work transform so what does it look like um, for an employee who's working at home and has to pay for their own wi-fi and maybe needs like a bigger working space because you know they they don't have a, a quiet office to go to and they have to like me share their <laughs> their office with a loud mouth dog who likes to bark at the delivery man so anyway i think that um the uh, the pandemic has kind of introduced some new risks um, that were familiar to gig workers um, to uh, regular employees. Yeah, Emily, I just want to say thank you for bringing the personal into it because I think that's great for this discussion. And I can tell you, I I can personally relate to traditional work feeling more like gig work now, right? The work from mm -hmm. home, the flexibility. To Jen's point, the focus on outcomes instead of a schedule. Uh, you yeah, know, I was very much the traditional going to the office every morning, you know, there until I headed home in the evening to grab dinner with the family. Um, it's completely different now, and it's very much more outcome-based and, and a lot more flexible. So, um, and I have one of those loudmouth dogs, too, just to okay. put that out there. <laughs> yeah, and Harry, before I have a question for them, a question for you. you now, this is great. You shift. Tell me what the shift is. Is the shift from... Uh, I should say from outcome to output base, I guess, uh, management. Have you had a, is, is that a change in mindset or have you actually had to change how you're managing your teams? So I, you know, I'll, I'll let Todd um, comment on this as well. I would say that um, definitely change the way that you manage your teams, right? The expectations have to change. Um, you find yourself because of your own personal experiences being more flexible with what others need to do. It's very much uh, outcome or output based and um, it, in the communication aspect of it, right? I actually, I find myself being able to more easily be visible in front of the organization because now it's virtual and um, I can be in front of all the employees in my division at one time instead of having to travel from location to location, right? So that the, the technology has helped the visibility and the communication, um, but also I've seen shifts in the way that I, uh, you know, interact with my own direct report team. So it's it's been it's been fascinating. Interesting. Well, thank you. Yeah. So uh, maybe I could just turn Harry's question a little bit on its side, which is, you know. Uh, how how will these traditional blend with uh, work blend with gig work? So, you know, what are the opportunities for businesses? So, if if you've got this gig, gig work expanding, you know what businesses what opportunities are for for business to cater to this crowd? Change what they're offering, build new business, offer new products that never were needed before. I mean, what's your perspective on uh, on uh, uh, job creation and job innovation opportunities or business innovation opportunities? Um, well, I think, you know, we've been thinking about this question specifically from the angle of insurance companies. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that um, we've talked a little bit about is just thinking about, well, first of all, how do you take uh, employee benefits and, you know, uh, insurance products that are offered to employees through employers and offer them direct to consumer. So, and this is again, something that I think like people who have been thinking about gig work for a while have been considering. So there's definitely an opportunity there, I think, to um, offer uh, these products DTC, but I think there's challenges to that um, that maybe are fairly obvious, but I think one of them is that that we found really interesting in our research specifically around insurance is just the kind of um, uh, lack of knowledge and uh, education that gig workers have around their own risks related to their work. And I think that's a really big hurdle for insurance companies who want to offer products 
um, direct to consumer um, that are supposed to protect uh, workers. So um, we we have some thoughts around kind of like how insurance companies specifically can sort of work to build a market there, which I think they're going to need to do and create awareness for workers around their risk, um, help them understand it better, and also kind of, um, I guess, help uh, all workers sort of see themselves as a business of one or as entrepreneurs, which we think is sort of the mindset that needs to be occupied for people to really uh, be able to um, manage the the risks of um, their employment on their own without, you know, a legal or HR department. Um, so that's kind of like a compact version of, I think, like a much bigger answer there. And I know that was really specific to insurance, but I think that's where our, our heads have been is like, where is the opportunity for insurance? Um, Jen, I don't know if you have anything you want to add there. Well, just to elaborate on what you're saying, I think, I think businesses now have an opportunity to, to in some ways, create an all-in solution that they can then tailor and personalize to various employees. It doesn't matter if you're a traditional employee within a framework of an HR department, as Emily, you said, or, or has a lot of infrastructure and support, or if it's somebody that's out on their own. Uh, you know, in some ways, that's just a, a, a those are different points along a journey, right? Uh, somebody who's out on their own could be the same as somebody who's brand new into a larger organization that just doesn't have that knowledge. Uh, and so really, I think there's an opportunity for um, businesses and employers to really start to think about broadening their their offering uh, in more of a, you know, straight to their, their end customer being their employee uh, in, in whatever form they come in um, and really not trying to differentiate or, or slice it at that level, but just to think about it on the, the larger journey. Yeah, and Emily, I, I, I can put an exclamation point, personal one, on, on uh, just the insurance comment because, you know, my daughter was home, <laughs> like older, <laughs> wanted to be an Uber Eats the delivery person, Harry, like, hey. <laughs> so started to do some research and realized, okay, the minute she's in her car and she uh, turns on that app, okay, she, she's off my auto policy, done. Like, whatever the crash is, not covered. Now, the mm -hmm. minute Laura says, okay, she accepts Laura's order, delivers the sandwiches to her house, makes – Absolutely nothing. <laughs> By the time you have the gas up, this is our experience where we live. Um, okay, you can get a policy to cover that. Now, what's the space when she turns on the app and is waiting for the order? There's no coverage. There's just like a, a gray zone. So um, her, 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 that profession, Todd, did not last very long in our household. That's <laughs> 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 what I found that out. So, Well, also – Anecdotally, from the research, like we've heard from um, in in the qualitative research we've done, where we like interview Uber drivers and other types of gig workers, we've heard people say things like, "Well, if I needed that insurance, like my employer would tell me that I needed it." And I think <clears throat> what's really interesting there is a couple of things. One is that I think um, because we have this sort of framework of the people or the companies that we're working for are our employers, um, we sort of expect them to take on that like burden of helping us understand and mediate our risks. And I think um, there isn't a lot of clarity for many people around the fact that they are not employees anymore and that these like companies are not their employers and they don't have the same incentives or obligations to them. And that's like one of those kind of awareness things that I think there uh, is a huge gap that that needs to be filled. Um, and I think, you know, insurance, uh, the insurance industry definitely has a role there to fill. Um, the other thing I kind of wanted to like circle back to what Jen was saying about thinking about the employee as the end customer um, in some of the, the employee benefits research that we've done. Well, we found sort of surprising, but maybe it shouldn't have been because, you know, we work at a very like small company um, is just the way that even when you're offering benefits to employees through the employer, the employer is still kind of the one treated as the end customer there mm -hmm. by the insurance company, 
for the benefit provider. And, um, and this has, you know, led to what we've sort of perceived in the research as kind of like a disconnect anyway between the employee benefits and the, and, and the employee, especially in terms of like, the employee experience and how they access those benefits and how they're utilized um, because they're kind of weirdly like kept out of the the loop um, when these these benefits are like designed and sold because they're being sold to the employer. And so even if you aren't necessarily trying to sell uh, an employee benefit direct to a consumer, still thinking about the consumer as the, the end user and as the um, customer, I think could potentially make the experience for all types of employees, whether or not you're a gig worker or a traditional employee, um, a lot more user-friendly. So, I kind of want to go a little bit deeper on the word where, right? We talk about where is in a location. So in the report, it talks about how employers had traditionally determined everything for the employees, right? So where do you live? How do you, you know, how do you plan your life around that? Uh, you know, how they access certain benefits. So if you take the tradition out of it and you don't have to essentially be at a physical location to perf perform your employment function, how how is this going to continue to change things looking ahead? So we've all learned personally, we can function just fine at home, you know, with children, with dogs, with delivery people coming at all hours, delivering Uber mm -hmm. sandwiches. But looking ahead, you know, what are those trends going to be in terms of determining the the where people are working? And if so, within the trends, do you see generational differences between types of employers, or I'm sorry, employees, whether it's gig or full time? Uh, what What do you see there? And what do you predict we might experience? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I mean, we've already seen, like, you know, this, this shift happen throughout the pandemic with people moving out of cities and into suburbs and vice versa, actually, too. Um, I live in Brooklyn, where rent has never been more expensive, like, ever, you know, um, and so, and that's also still sort of a mystery to me, but, uh, but I guess I I don't know. I have I, I feel like there's just a lot of ways this could go because I think for one, what I think is sort of interesting about the employer not being kind of the organizing principle in people's lives is that it creates opportunity for like other things to become the organizing principle in their lives? We've always worked in different spaces, right? Whether you've been a traditional worker five years ago um, and you had to take work home or you did it on your commute or uh, you're a writer and you would go to the coffee shop or you would go to, you know, I, I think that, I think the where has always been very flexible. I think now uh, as, as, we're realizing how important uh, well-being is and, and that work-life balance. This light is, is being um, put on this area of wear more, more deliberately, which I think is great. But I do think that our overall, we've always explored on where is the best place that I can be most productive. Uh, and I think it goes back to um, that employees want to, you know, they don't, they don't necessarily want to be told what to do. They want to have the space and the ability to do what they are asked of. Um, and that could be location-based, that could be time-based, it could be a variety of different things. And, and that's why I think all of this conversation does come back to that flexibility. Um, and, and we, we often uh, experience this in, in all, all of our projects. It's, it's really identifying you know, meeting people where they are, right? And and that is becoming far more front and center for that employee employer relationship. Yeah, that that's great. I want to jump into on on what is empowering the fact that we can work anywhere, and, and that's technology. And I think we we've hit on some themes of technology as we've gone through this. You know, obviously we can work where we want because all this technology has advanced so quickly. And there's all sorts of interesting things with AI and data, and there's all things to empower us to be able to work from anywhere. But th th I also wonder about the downsides too. You know, you bring this up in your Beyond Burnout 
uh, piece, which um, I think was really compelling. The, the fact that you can do anything from anywhere also is blurring that line between work and, and, and not work. And, you know, what are what are some of the things employers need to need to watch out for? Um, you know, how do we protect our employees from this constant sort of, well, you can work from anywhere, so you probably should be working uh, sort of mindset? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think, like, one of the things we talk about in the report is, um, I think there's a section in there called, like, sharing the burden of boundaries. And I think, you know, what you just spoke to is that some of these boundaries get erased. Um, you know, when we used to be able to just go into the office and maybe leave our work at home, um, that was, you know, a pretty... Um, a uh, real boundary that existed between work and life, not that this wasn't disrupted by email and like all these other technological advances. Um, but, you know, it was something. And once that went away, I think for a lot of people, um, you know, that's, that's when we, the, the burnout kind of sets in when those boundaries don't exist anymore. And I think what has uh, traditionally been the case is that kind of enforcing those boundaries has been the work of the employee. So, you know, they're the ones that need to stop answering the emails and um, tell people they're out of office or they're not working, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the ideas we sort of explore in the report um, is the way that employers can help set some of these boundaries. So um, I think, you know, you've, you've seen stuff like this in Europe, and I don't really anticipate this happening in the U.S., but where it's like illegal for you know, a boss to send an email after 6 p.m. Um, and I actually, I think there was something recently that I just read about where someone in Europe is working for a U.S. company and that company was basically surveilling them having to have their camera and their, 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 their screen washed all day long and they sued that company and they won. Um, and they said that was a violation of privacy. So I think like one thing is don't do that don't like surveil your employees all day. Like, I, I don't think that's going to make anyone feel good at work. And that is sort of the opposite of what we're talking about. But the other thing is just um, finding ways to create boundaries for employees, whether those are kind of more simple interpersonal things like the boss, like not sending emails after 6 p.m. or the boss, like taking all of their vacation time. Um, you know, those are simple things that I think can be done, especially like in smaller smaller businesses. But then we also sort of explore like how can these things kind of be like institutionalized through technology. Um, so like one of the thing, like one of the sort of concepts that we tested um, in the research that you're mentioning was this concept around sort of tracking people's uh, time through you know, whether they're, they're submitting that time or whether you're doing that through their calendars or whatnot, there's lots of different ways of doing that and kind of create building like uh, AI based uh, alert systems that would be like, hey, you worked too much. And then, you know, maybe offering them a day off or telling them to come to work late tomorrow because, you know, they put too many hours in this week. And so I think those kinds of things can go a long way and kind of I guess alleviating some of that burnout, but also creating more trust between like the employer and the employee. But something else that's interesting about having technology do that um, is that it makes it not personal. So you don't have to like go to your boss and be like, hey, I worked like 60 hours last week. Can I have this time off? It's, you know, it's, it's neutralized in a way that I think can make um, sort of take that burden off of employees, if that makes sense. So if I could take us in a related but a little bit different direction, because uh, I think some of it uh, comes back to the topic of burnout. Um, one of the significant trends that we talked about in previous episodes when we talk about social change and what people are paying attention to in the United States much more closely today than they were certainly pre-pandemic is the topic of mental health and overall well-being. And um, I'm curious for your thoughts around uh, that particular social movement and how employers, um, I should say companies really, because employers implies just traditional employees, um, but how companies are going to have to uh, react to the attention to mental health and overall well-being as far as um, the services or resources that they provide to their workers. Yeah, 
Um, so a couple of thoughts there. One is, I just want to say, we did this really interesting research with millennials a couple of years back in 2019. So like right before the pandemic and burnout was like the thing that was really like surfaced in that research. And we did this kind of fun interactive workshop where we had millennials kind of um, <clears throat> in small groups, uh, sort of concepting and brainstorming different products or services that they would like to see. And so much of it was around uh, mental health. And so uh, since that time, and you know, even then, you were seeing a lot more companies offer different kinds of mental health services as perks or benefits. Um, and that continues. And I think that's a good thing. But what's interesting to me is that I think that um, part of the interest in mental health services that come through an employer has to do with like, that's the sort of like only framework that like millennials have for how they might be able to access a mental health services, but also um, how they might be able to improve their mental health. But what I think we saw in our research in Beyond Burnout, we have this question that's very leading, but also we got like a very interesting response that was like, to what extent do you agree with the statement that the way we work is uh, hurting our mental health and is unsustainable? It was something like that. And 74% of our respondents agreed with the statement that the way that we work is hurting our mental health. And so while I think a lot of the focus has been on like providing services to help people deal with mental health, what we've kind of been ignoring is the way that work is actually hurting mental health and the, and the way that we work is hurting our mental health. And so I think far more probably impactful than just, you know, being like, oh, hey, you have access to online therapy is just like thinking about how you change the workplace and how you change culture um, so that it's not hurting people's mental health. And, you know, a part of that is obviously like probably working less um, and, you know, doing some of the things we talked about, like creating boundaries at work. Um, but in a lot of our research, people are just also looking for, you know, better relationships with their colleagues, for their uh, projects to be funded, for them to have like the time they feel like they need to like do something well. Um, so I think there's just a lot that can change about the workplace itself before you even have to like layer on these products and services to fix a problem that like you created basically. So. Yeah, I, I think that's really spot on. It's not about, I mean, yes, it's about providing those benefits, but it's also about looking at the work itself and finding ways of, of really emotionally connecting, right? I mean, I think traditionally work has been emotionless um, and we're not robots and we have emotions. And I think it's really understanding what are those emotional drivers and, and even recognizing like, oh, are, are you, are you, are you okay? Right. Just even that validation of like, oh, wow, you're actually asking me that. I think those are the, 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 the those connections. Um, maybe it's with your colleagues or even your boss or just a recognition that um, we, we do have emotions and it's okay to have those while we're working. One of the um, questions we asked in that same survey was an open text question that was just like, what's one thing your employer could do to make your job better? And like we heard the same phrase over and over and over again, which was treat us like humans. And that is kind of an ambivalent phrase, you know, like what does that actually mean? And I think that's what we're trying to kind of explore with some of the research is, is what does it mean to like be treated like a human at work? Um, but it, it spoke to the fact that like a lot of people just like don't feel like they're being treated in a, you know, like a human at work. And we need to figure out what that means and, and, and how to make people, you know, feel like human beings in the workplace. Yeah, well, well part of, you know, treat me like a, a human means, you know, I really don't like the device you have in the office. I want to use my iPhone or I want to use my tablet. You know, bring your own device. Um, uh, I think about a lot of software choices. You know, it used to be the mm -hmm. IT department would come in and do the art and say, "Here it is." Now I'd like you to use this email. Uh, you know, is um, treatment like a human equal to you know consumerization of driving business? And 
from your study, does it seem like that trend is just going to accelerate? It sounds like it will from the, the discussion today. Jen, what do you think? You have thoughts on this? <laughs> Um, you, you know, yes, I, I think that um, technology, um, I think the, uh, the access, our, our digital experience and our technology experiences uh, that are happening in our personal lives is definitely in our professional lives. And, and really, I mean, this is this has been a trend that I think will just continue. Um, and it's, it's, uh, and, and, and I think it's I think it's good. I think it just becomes harder when you start to, as I was mentioning earlier, when you start to personalize, you start to provide all of those pathways uh, for employees uh, to have that better experience and to really feel like they're not tasked with the good old days of I've got my iPhone and my BlackBerry and I might even have two Blackberries and I might not know which one's ringing or which one to answer. You know, all of that caused burnout, too. So I think it's. Um, you know, these are these are not new challenges. They're just going to become even more apparent as as. It, but but in some ways, I'm wondering if that marketplace will become all encompassing and will become more interconnected and and ultimately then relieve some of that. So I think these are all um, aspects that we've been exploring with um, with our work, uh, and and it's it's just there's so much that could possibly happen here but um i do think that that yes we it, it if we want this this flexibility and if we're driving this um opportunity to to explore how we all work and we live it's it's a part of the equation yeah paul i i think that's a Great question, and, and Jen, I love your answer there. I know in mean, one of the earlier episodes, I remember making the comment that workers are consumers, and I don't know why we would expect someone who is pushing for consumerism and flexibility and access as a consumer to not expect the same thing in their work environment. And so to me, there's a parallel there that I think is just fascinating. Yeah, and staying on that that path and, and be on burnout, you explore the question, how can we make work more livable and life more workable? And I think it's interesting, right? Because in some ways, life and work became one as we all entered into, you know, our locations during the pandemic. And there was fewer, there were fewer boundaries. You know, you couldn't physically leave the space to tell yourself it's time to stop working. Um, so do, you know, is, is that the question? You know, how do we make work more livable and life more workable? Do we want to, you know, integrate them? Do we want to separate them? I know you have a lot of insights in that report, but, you know, what suggestions do you have on how employers can help meet those challenges um, that employees are facing right now? I mean, I think the, the culture question is, like, really important. Um, and it's not, I don't have a lot of, like, specific um, strategic ideas for this, but just, you know, if uh, we're working all the time, I mean, I, I guess it's like, I want my workplace to, to, to be, I guess, you know, the kind of place that I would want to, I, I was going to say the kind of place that I would want to live, but that's not right. Cause I think that whole like Google Plex, like make work like home isn't, isn't right either. Cause that kind of encourages you not to have those boundaries. But I guess I'm like, I want to work with people I like. I want to work with people that treat me with respect in the same way that those are like the people I want to surround myself with in my regular life. And so I guess I just think trying to create a culture that makes people, you know, enjoy being at work and that makes people feel like what they're doing is meaningful and important and that makes people you know feel like they're uh respected and um and and valued um is is really important and i don't know that there are like specific benefits or policies necessarily and i mean i'm sure there are things that can contribute to this but I really think it comes back to that, like kind of we are humans in the workplace. Like, how do we make people how do we how do we make people feel like humans? We make them feel like humans by, you know, supporting them, respecting them, um, giving them autonomy, giving them a flexibility, a lot of the things that we've discussed. And I think this is a very like um, 
uh, I guess, you know, it, there, there's a lot of ways of doing this. Um, and I think Jen maybe has like some more like strategic thoughts on this that are, um, yeah. Well, I, this is, this is one that I want to continue exploring, uh, just, uh, doing, doing all of the work, being the freelancer, being the remote gig worker, being the full-time employee. Like I've, I've, I've done that, um, personally. And I think for me, what, that balance of, of life and work is like what I feel like companies need to figure out is the wa water cooler moment. So as much as I believe that we should be focused on outcomes and not time spent, what was really nice about your traditional, you know, Oh, I go into the job at this hour and I leave at this hour was that there was downtime, right? There was downtime. You were all physically together where, you know, you weren't necessarily working. You were passing in the hallway, going to the bathroom, whatever it might've been, you going literally to the water cooler and you talk to the random person that you never interact with or would have a meeting with, but you might find some personal connection that you would take home or you would have, you'd overhear some conversation from a business perspective that would shine a light on what your problem you're trying to solve. So I do, I do wonder what that could look like and how do we find space for that? Because I think that that's an aspect of where personal would come into the professional um, arena. And I think we're now focused on trying to reverse that, but it's, it's where, where do we find that downtime and explore uh, people that are all coming together and doing a job together? Um, it, you know, there's, there's benefit there and there's opportunity there. So um, I don't necessarily have a, an answer, but it's, it's something that I think is important to explore. Yeah, that that's fantastic. So I guess as we as we move to wrap this up, this has just been a fan, really great dialogue. Uh, there's so much here to chew on. But Harry, I wanted to invite you if you had any final questions for our guests or maybe any insights that you've pulled from the dialogue. So Todd, I guess first I'll start with just you, Emily, Jen, thank you for joining us today. It has been, I think, a great conversation. Um, we touched upon a lot of topics. I was jotting them down along the way employee experience, risk, um, location, gig, mental health, technology, consumerism, um, treating people like a human and culture. And I guess it, there's a lot there. And so my final question for both of you is, is, is you think about what we talked about today or the research that you've done more broadly, um, as not only as someone who works with employers, um, and, and insurance carriers and other companies about how to um, how to be focused on on the consumer. Um, which of these topics most resonates with you personally? Like, I mean, everyone loves some aspect of their research the most, and I'm just I'm curious to get your sense of um, what resonates the most with you personally. I saved the tough one for last. That is a tough one. Um, I guess I can, I could take this, um, and I don't want to take this in too far of a different direction, but just in kind of, uh, preparing for this podcast, I was like reading about the quiet quitting trend. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, one of the things that I sort of thought was interesting in what I was reading was how there were the people that were doing the quiet quitting who were kind of talking about what it meant to them, which was like, you know, not going above and beyond at work and not being defined by your labor and not having work be your life. And then the sort of uh, prognosticator or writer, whoever it was, would kind of summarize that as like, oh, so doing the bare minimum at work. And I think that there's like this disconnect um, that exists and it gets to maybe some generational stuff too around like people just wanting like a good quality of life um, and wanting like work to be a part of that and wanting to work and caring about work, but just not wanting to be completely defined by that and have that take over your life. And I mean, I think as a parent um, with young children, like that really resonates with me where I I was happy to go back to work. It gave me this sense of like purpose and self that I like had an identity outside of like, you know, caring for those small children. And 
that's really important to me. But I think, you know, the moment that starts to make me feel like it's taking me away from my family and not allowing me to be the parent that I want to be, you know, I start to resent that. And I think the desire for like a lot of people is just to have some kind of balance in their life where they can, you know, enjoy their work and feel like it's meaningful and purposeful without it taking over their lives. And, um, and I think that can get translated as like laziness or, you know, not wanting to work. Um, but I think there's like something much deeper there that's really human. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, what's really interesting about the conversations that we've been having well, today and just like recently in the zeitgeist around uh, this topic. So, I'll I'll just add because Emily, you mentioned uh, kids, right? You know, recently I was thinking to myself, you know, my kids come home and they're showing uh, their graded papers, and they're like, "Look, I got you know, I got all A's," and I'm like yeah, that's what I want for my job too. You know, like there's, you know, it, you, when you're a kid, you, you get that, that reinforcement, you get those grades, you get that trophy, you get that, that win. And I think that there's something to, what does that look like for us as um, in, in the workforce? Uh, what is that version uh, for us? Um, I could use one of those when I'm a mom too, but, <laughs> um, but just to answer your question, Harry, really quickly here, I, I think that, you know, for me, it's it's an interest in actually creating a feedback loop with um, businesses and their employees. I think that, you know, that's a lot of what we do. We, we want to talk to people. We want to understand that human problem. And I think that it's really great that that is happening more often now in light of, of these shifts within the workforce. Um, and I think that feedback loop uh, can only make the experience better for everyone. I mean, whether it's your, your employees, your business itself, uh, your revenue goals. Um, I think it's just that that to me is, is where I think is um, I'm, I'm very interested. Good. Thank you. Well, I think that is a perfect note for us to end on. So uh, I want to thank my co-hosts, but I especially want to thank our guests, uh, Emily and Jen, your, your perspectives, uh, the cake and arrow research. It, it's just led to a absolutely fantastic conversation. Thank you to our audience. We are thrilled you decided to join us. I hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed having the discussion. And I hope you'll watch out for our future episodes on Working Forward. Uh, we've got some more fun stuff planned for you. So stay tuned and thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Working Forward, Future of Work podcast series. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the hosts and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Symmetra Life Insurance Company or its affiliates. The host is not affiliated with Symmetra Life Insurance Company and or any of its affiliates and is solely responsible for the content.